Amen, amen. Do you have a, do you moms have a happy Mother's Day? Was it, you have a good day last Sunday? Yeah, great, great. I mean, it was a, a great time for all of us here at Church 180. I just want to remind you to get your photos back there. And they, they all, man, we got some beautiful families here at Church 180. All these, these pictures came out great, and uh, the kids cooperated for the most part. You know, it's a little bit tricky with the kids. They want to squirm around, but we got a lot of great, great pictures. And thank you, moms, once again. You know, you really are uh, what, you know, what makes a home a home, you know. And I just remember, um, you know, when I was uh, just a... A young, a young preacher, and uh, when I wasn't married yet to Danielle and uh, the church that I was in, we had a, they had a house, and that's where I lived. You walk in that house, there was no curtains on the windows. There's no decorations anywhere. There was no candles burning and making the place smell nice and fresh and, and sweet. And then one day, I married this beautiful lady named Danielle, and she came in after we got married, and she decorated the place. It had curtains. I had fresh cooked meals and in the evening. We actually had candles and we had plants and flowers and the, and the place totally changed. <laughs> Any of you guys know what I mean by that? Things change a little bit when you get married and you start a family. It's great. But today I want to talk about, um, talk, continue the series on, on, our, on our home. It's uh, a series about family. And I think family is so important. You know, it's, uh, I believe that our, our first duty, God is number one, right? God's number one in our lives. Our second duty and responsibility is to our family. You know, and I believe that that's where real ministry takes place. I mean, I believe that's the most important area of focus as, for us as, um, as, as adults, as married people, as even single people, as you are preparing to enter into marriage. You know, don't just tune Pastor Jeff out today because you're not married yet. Say, this is my time, my time to tune in and prepare for the man or the woman that God has, that God has for me so that one day... If I just remember a few things that Pastor Jeff says, we're well, going to have a, a good marriage, and I'm going to read some books and study on my own and, 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 and seek God. And that's, you know, for, for years, Danielle and I, that's what we did. We weren't married, and uh, we, neither one of us, uh, we, we, we believed that God was going to send just the right person for us. And we spent those years just uh, preparing for the right person. The right person. We read books. We we studied. We were our mentors would uh you know we'd learn from them and it's an op. It's a great time to prepare yourself to for the days ahead. And I believe that God has um, great 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 plans for all of our families and single people here today. You know, and today I want to talk about peace in our home. Peace. That's that's a good thing to have in our home, isn't it? No. You like guys like to fight, <laughs> but I like peace, and we like peace, and that's something that we uh, that you know we really strive for, and it's a quality that we all uh, that we really appreciate. Unfortunately, not all families are characterized by 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 peace, but oftentimes it's characterized by conflict. It's a very real thing. We all have conflict. It's nothing that, that our whole, none, if, if we was there someone here and you have the perfect home and there's no conflict. I mean, I want you to come and speak to me because I want to know. What what you're doing because we all have conflict right yeah. yeah we do you know some of us you know we have our, our homes may be characterized by conflict right now you know even the best of families um they we they uh they 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 can experience uh conflict but we want our homes to be characterized by peace and some of us might be thinking man you know my home hasn't been that peaceful i mean i actually right now you might you might feel me my home is in this place where we're we're normally a good family but actually we're we're kind of like feeling a little bit dysfunctional right now and and things aren't going very well and we feel like it's just like man what's going on here and you're in this cycle of dysfunction it seems and 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 one person you, some, you hurt somebody, they hurt you back, and it's not intentional, but you find yourself in this, in this cycle, and you know, and, and, but you want your home to be peaceful, right? But maybe it's not your fault. Maybe that's not, you know, it's not your fault. The, the reality is that, you know, <laughs> a little funny here, but every, every, every family has a cycle, right? Every, every family, you can think of somebody right now, and it may not be in your home, but somebody in your family, they, they might be just a little bit dys dysfunctional, they're, they're psycho. I mean, if you look somewhere, it might not be in your home, but it might be in your extended family, but everybody in their family has someone who's, who's hard to manage, difficult to, you know, difficult to deal with, Right? Right? Me? I got those people in my family? Huh? 
but they're hard to deal with. And, you know, I, I think, I don't know, just it, it might be a, a spiritual principle or something. Every family's got to have one, you know. And uh, we sit around the Thanksgiving table, and all of a sudden they've got this crazy conversation. And it's getting tense or whatever, you know what I mean? And, uh, it'll, and you know, let's just prove it, you know. Um, how many would say somewhere in your family there is a psycho? Yeah? Okay. Difficult person? So remember, everybody, everybody has a psycho in the family. And I don't know. If you didn't raise your hand, I've got to wonder, you know, maybe, maybe <laughs> you might be that one. But all fun, you know, all fun. But, um, you know, relationships are challenging and they can be very difficult at times, you know. And uh, unfortunately, we get hurt the worst by the people that we love the most. And the people that we love the most are often the people that we hurt the most. And unfortunately, that seems to be the case. And, uh, you know, it's amazing how even great families slip into, into dysfunctional cycles. You know, I, I thought it was funny the other day. I was even watching the girls play yesterday, and they're, they're wrestling on, on one of our chairs, and they're having a good time wrestling, having a, just a, a blast. And all of a sudden, they, they both fall off the chair, and they both hurt, and they both hurt each other, and, and they're crying, and they're a little bit upset at each other. And just a little while later, they're back at the same thing again, the same thing that got them hurt. But isn't that kind of like what it's in some of our relationships, though? <laughs> people that we love and we get involved and and you know and and they hurt they hurt us and we hurt them and uh and we go into this cycle of dysfunction and it's because conflict after conflict and things get better and then we go and we go and repeat the same cycle and it's 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 we do it once again but we end up in challenging relationships instead of those that are in characterized by peace. You know, I don't know what it looks like for you, um, a challenging relationship in your life. It might be that you're a, a young mom, you're trying to raise your kids, and maybe your, your mom is looking over your shoulder and how you're raising your kids, and you're like, Mom, I got this. You don't need to be, you don't need to be telling me how to raise my kids. Or maybe your, your kids are always fighting. Maybe it's your teenager that's um, kind of got their own, own thing going on, and they've got their own mind doing their own thing. And it's a challenging relationship right now. Maybe you're married in a, in a blended family and you're trying to raise kids and, and, and there's somebody else's kids that, married that, that now are your kids and you're trying to, to figure, there's a lot of moving parts and you're trying to figure out how to have a healthy dynamic in the midst of that. Maybe you're an adult and you still can't forgive mom or dad because of something that happened in the past. And it's a challenging relationship. And when, we, and when you talk and when you, when you touch base and when you maybe call, there, there's conflict that arises, like these, these, un, these unresolved things in your life, right? It happens. Relationships are tricky, especially with the people sometimes in our own homes. And the people that we love most are often the people that we hurt the most and, the, and often the people that hurt us the most. And a lot of times it's not intentional. Matthew 9, 5 says this. Jesus said this. It was on the Sermon of the, on the Mount. He said, blessed are the peacemakers... The title of my message today is Make Peace. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be, what? Be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And the Bible um, the Bible's written in... Um, a couple different languages in the Old Testament. It's mostly Hebrew. New Testament, it's it's Greek. And uh, in the in the Greek, in this in this um, here in, in Matthew, the word peace is this is a word called irene. Um, but in the in the Hebrew, it's this word shalom. Shalom. This word doesn't just simply mean peace like we know be, that we know because you know in the Hebrew language in the Greek language that that language could mean so much more than what the English language could be translating it as. And here's what it means: Shalom means peace, harmony, wholeness, completeness, prosperity, welfare, tranquility. It's God's best. It's wholeness. It's completeness. And I believe that God wants that in all of our homes. He wants wholeness. He wants healing. He wants restoration. He wants prosperity. He's not, I mean, yeah, he, does. he wants you to have a little bit of money, but, but he, prosperity in your emotions, prosperity in your relationships, and, and how we get along. 
And this doesn't mean that there's an absence of trouble in our families because we all deal with conflict. We all deal with trouble. We've got to work through some issues, but we're seeking God's best, God's highest good. You know, this, this scripture in Matthew was actually a shocking statement to the people that Jesus was preaching to during the time. Because they lived in a culture that said an eye for an eye and a, and a tooth for a tooth, you know? It was kind of a, it was kind of a, a shocking thing to them, you know? And, but Jesus was teaching something different. He was saying when somebody, when somebody strikes you, you know, turn your other cheek. When they ask for your cloak, give it, all, give it to them, you know? And, and he, was, he, was, he was challenging them and teaching them something that, that was revolutionary. And many times when we're in a, in a conflict, there's trouble in our family, and somebody hurts us. We think to ourselves, well, I've got a right to be angry. I've got a right to be offended. I've got a right to be hurt. So I can understand why you're hurt. I can understand why you might be offended. I, I understand why you might be angry. But here's the thing. When we start in a relationship, start talking about our rights, we start putting ourselves first, and it's egocentric. Think about this, and here's something I want you to write down. When we put ourselves first, we put peace last. When we put ourselves first, our emotions, when we make it all about us and how I feel right now, what, what you didn't do for me, we make it about us, we put ourselves first, we put peace last. You notice it says, blessed are the peacemakers. It didn't say, blessed are the peacekeepers. And there's a difference here about peacemakers and peacekeepers, and we get things a little bit mixed up here. Let's talk a little bit about what peacekeepers are and what, the, what they do. So what are peacekeepers? Peacekeepers often avoid conflict to keep the peace. They avoid conflict in order to keep the peace. So there's all these unresolved issues lying underneath. There's nothing that was ever talked out. There's nothing that, was, that, that, that wasn't worked, worked through. But instead, we walk around the issue. We avoid, we avoid conflict to keep the peace, and we, we just kind of make a truce, and we, and we agree not to talk about the issue. So we're keeping peace, but inside of us, all this stuff is just adding up and adding up and adding up, and there's all this unresolved conflict that eventually gives us a lack of peace in our home. So we get together at family dinners, we act like we're getting along, but um, you know what I mean. We go to, we go to family functions and, and, we, and we've got some unresolved conflict with, with Uncle Joe or with mom or dad or with your brother or sister, and you see them, and because of all this unresolved conflict and because we decide that we're going to keep peace and not work through some situations, we've got all this added stuff inside of us, and one day, when just the right thing is said, it's snap. <laughs> Full-blown conflict. Because we're keeping peace and we weren't making peace. Can I get an amen anywhere? This is good stuff. I'm not trying to brag on my sermon, but this is the word of God. Keeping peace is different than making peace. So we bottle things up and all of a sudden it explodes and all of a sudden you hear things like, man, I'm sick of you. You didn't do this for me. And, and you think to yourself, well, where did that come from? It's because of the unresolved conflict that, we, that, we, that we've let go on for a period of time. Jesus didn't say, blessed are the peacekeepers. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. So what will a peacemaker do? A peacemaker will embrace conflict to make peace. A peacemaker will embrace conflict to make peace. I'm not saying, you know, go punch people and like, you know, that kind of conflict. 
But man, we got to work things out. There is going to be conflict. We can, we, we can approach conflict in two ways. We can ignore it and place it to the side, or we can choose to talk it through, work it out, and come to a place where there is forgiveness and healing in that relationship. You ever have something that somebody, somebody did something to you a, a while ago, and there's always that awkward tension because things didn't get resolved? Have a hard time looking at them in the face, in their eyes? A little awkward when we got to sit down at the table with them or see them at work. I think we've all experienced that in our lives because some things just, just did not get worked out. There's a tension because of unresolved conflict. So peacemakers embrace conflict to make, also embrace conflict to make peace. See, peacekeepers are focused on the now and what feels good. They're focused on the now and what feels good in the moment, but peacekeepers value the relationship and look at the long-term effect of what they're going through. And we're not going to avoid the issues. We're going to work them, we're going to work them out. And with, with the help of the Prince of Peace himself, I believe that we can experience that peace in our home that God intends for all of us to have. To have healing, to have wholeness, to have prosperity, to have completeness in our homes. Is that our desire today? To have some peace in our homes. And we're, with some of us, we're experiencing, and we're all probably experiencing a level of peace, but we all know and we all can identify some areas in our houses, in our homes, in our families that we can work on and we can, we can ask God to help us with. Which brings me to our key thought from last week. I mentioned it last week, that we're not just a Christian home, but we're a Christ-centered home. A lot of people say they're Christians, and, uh, but they're not necessarily followers of Christ. Um, you know, many people are Christian by name. Their homes are Christian by name, but not really making him first in their family, in their home. You see, Jesus isn't just a part of, when I'm a Christ-centered, a, have a Christ-centered home, and I'm a Christ-centered person, Jesus isn't just a part of my life. He is my life. When, when my home is Christ-centered, he's not just something that we do on Sunday. He's not just something that we think about once in a while. He is a part. He is our life. He's not just a part. He doesn't have a compartment over here. But we involve him in every area of our life. We involve him. He's first in our marriage. He comes before our marriage. We, and he comes before our kids. He comes before everything. Because when we are in right relationship with him, he blesses everything else underneath. Amen. 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 But in a Christian home that's a culturally Christian home, when Christ isn't the center of the home, when Christ isn't number one, when Christ isn't the, the focus of the home, and, 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 and many people, this is very common, when, when conflict arises, we, for, we say, forget you, hey, uh, you hold a grudge or, or hold on forgiveness. Romans 12, 17, 18, and verse 21 says this, do not repay anyone with evil, for evil with evil, but be careful to do what is right in everyone's eyes, in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, don't be thinking about the person next to you. Let God speak to you right now, okay? As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not overcome evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So what do peacemakers do? I'm going to give you three things that peacemakers do, and I want you to write them down. I want, you to, I want us to think about this and let God speak to us through this word. First of all, peacemakers tell the truth in love. Amen. Ephesians 4, 15 says, Instead, we'll speak the truth in love, growing in every way more like Christ. It doesn't say yell the truth in love. That's not what, that's not what the Bible says. And so many of us, we're, we're so quick to, to get angry and yell the truth in love. We, we approach conflict and, and we, we start bringing up the past. We say, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Why, why, how, come, how come you did this? Man, you always leave your clothes laying around. Man, you, you don't do enough around here. Man, the, the kids, they're, man, they're more important than I am.
And these are real issues that need to be addressed, but often they come in the heat of the battle, right? We get all, all heated up, and, we, and then we get into these places of conflict, and all of a sudden we start bringing up all this stuff and everything that we start unloading because it's not been resolved. And in and, and a time of anger, in a time of, of conflict, we, we, start just, we just start nailing the other person and start bringing up all the, all the stuff that, that hurt us in the past. These are real issues that need to be addressed, though. You see, when we enter into conflict with our, with our spouse or in our family, the best time to bring up new issues is in non-conflict times. When you're thinking straight, when you're not just going to say things that you wish that you didn't say before, when you start unloading and say unwise things and you're talking out of your emotion rather than logically or with, or, or with, uh, with, with great thought and prayer behind it. Not when other people are around. And we need to remember to do this, is to confront the issue and not the person. To confront the issue and not the person. Like this, you know, for example, when you don't listen to me, I feel like you don't value me. When you, raise, when you, when you yell at me, I feel disrespected. When you continue to check your phone at the table, I feel like our family's not that important. When you tell even white lies, it causes me to not trust you. And we've got to make sure that we do these things. We're not in a place where we're going to attack the person. Because when we're in conflict and we're in the heat of the moment, our, our natural tendency is to go towards the person, you, you bad person. You hurt me. You good? Amen. Number two, secondly, a peacemaker apologizes when we are wrong. You see, oftentimes when we think that we don't have anything to apologize for, we probably have a lot to apologize for. Huh? In a conflict, it, it, most of the time, it's not just one person. In any, any kind of marriage situation, what I found over, over the years, it's not just because of one person. It's because it's a, it's a group effort, and it's usually a, a team effort that people are in conflict and people are having trouble. There's, a, there's, there's two sides of the story. And what we've got to do is we've got to, we've got to humble ourselves because, you know, humility is important because, you know, pride... Pride and stubbornness are a good way to kill a relationship. You want a strong marriage? Humble yourself. Walk in forgiveness. Walk in grace. Because guess what? The people that you live with, they're not going to have, they're not going to be perfect. They're going to they're gonna mess up sometimes. And they're, they, they might do things that might frustrate you or annoy you at times. But you know what? Some things that you do frustrate and annoy them too. <laughs> so it's important for us to walk in grace in our homes. You know, I, I've used this illustration before. You know, when we're, in a, we're, when we're go, uh, driving a car, we're going down the road, and somebody cuts out in front of us. We're, we're shaking our fists, and hopefully it's just our fists, you know, and we're, we're saying, how dare them? How dare them cut in front of me? But then we're in a rush, and we cut in front of somebody else. We say, well, they, 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 they probably understand. We've got so much great, more grace for ourselves than we do for other people. We've got to resist the temptation of being judgmental and condemning towards people. What does the Bible say? Jesus said, take the, take the log out of your own eye before you try to pick the speck out of somebody else's. We've got to show grace. We've got to show love. We've got to show humility towards one another. We've got to be quick to acknowledge that what we did is wrong. 
You know, it's okay to be wrong. It really is. We all make mistakes. In relationships, we, we can't just act like we, we, we've got it all perfect. We've got it all right. And we've got to be able to admit our mistakes and see what, what we're doing in our life, how it's affecting the other person, whether it's our, our son, our daughter, our husband, and see how it's hurting us and be able to, be able to work it out and be able to say, I was wrong. Please forgive me. Instead of saying, I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm sorry that you were hurt by that. <laughs> I'm sorry your feelings were hurt. But be able to say, sorry, forgive me because I did this. James 5, 16 says, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. It's important for us to admit to specific actions and attitudes without excuses. I want, you to, I want you to remember this. People of integrity offer no excuses. Instead, they take personal responsibility. And so in our relationships, we need to take this approach. We need, to, we need to take personal responsibility for what happened in our relationship. If there is something going down in your home and there's tension, there's struggle, there's conflict... We need to take personal responsibility for the part that we played in it. You may feel like it's not the, the, the issue at hand, but we need to recognize that something that we did, something that we said, probably played a part in that, and we can offer and, and repent and, and ask forgiveness for the part that we played in that situation. So people of integrity offer no excuses. Well, I did this because you. Well, I did this because I felt this way. It was because of this, and it was because of that. It was because of this situation that happened to me years ago. We need to resist the temptation of using those situations from our past or what the other person did to blame for our actions. We need to take personal responsibility. When we stand before God someday, we're going to be held accountable for our own actions. Not because of what somebody else did, not because of our childhood, not because of, of someone mistreating us or hurting our feelings. We're going to stand before God and we're going to give an account for our own actions in our own marriage, in our own relationships. We need to take the same approach. I'm going to take personal responsibility for my sins and I'm going to seek forgiveness, I'm going to seek restoration. As hard as it might be, it might be hard for me to, to humble myself. It might be hard for me to, 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 to say that I was wrong, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to bite the bullet, and I'm going to honor God because, because humility is important in a relationship. Because you know what? Family is always worth it. Your marriage is always worth it. Your relationship with your kids is always worth it. Your relationship with your brother or your sister or your mom or your dad, it's always worth it. It's all right for your, for your ego to be hurt a little bit. It's all right for you, for you to, to, to humble yourself and say that you're wrong. It's all right because, you know what? We're not always right. If you think that you're always right, you're probably wrong. So people integrity offer no excuses, but they take personal responsibility. Not, I hurt your feelings. Sorry, your feelings got hurt, but, or you, but you, you, you think what I did was wrong, but. Instead we say, well, you know what? I shouldn't have yelled at you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Or I was totally in, insensitive and disconnected. Please forgive me. Maybe we should say something like this. I, I should have called and, and let you know that I was going to be home a couple hours late. Please forgive me. That was wrong. I didn't take, I didn't take you into consideration. I'm sorry that um, the way I talked to you in front of my friends disrespected you. Or I was selfish and it was all about me. Or, I'm sorry I threw the cat out the window because I wanted to see if he landed on his feet. No. <laughs> trying to see what you guys would react to that. But <laughs> did that once. I was uh, seven years old, and uh, the cat landed on the feet but ran away, never came back. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, man, don't do that. It's a good cat, too. But, you know, a little boy experimenting. Um, 
<laughs> and we got to remember this, and uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of information here, but we got to remember this also in our relationship that remorse is different than repentance. Remorse is different than repentance. I'm sorry is for mistakes. Will you forgive me is for sin. We all make mistakes. You know, oops, I spilled the milk. I'm sorry. Um, oops, I, uh, you know, I, I bumped into you. I'm sorry. But when we hurt somebody, please forgive me. I was wrong. Forgive me because I hurt you. I, I disrespected you. I, I, I wasn't taking you into consideration. Please forgive me. So there's an important, it's important to remember that there's a difference between remorse and repentance. Something that Danielle have done, and I have done since we were, we, um, we were together is we, we try to come together when we, when we have a disagreement and apologize to each other. Not just an I'm sorry, but please forgive me. Right? Please forgive me. And it's important for us as married couples to remember this with our children, with our husband, with our wife, to be sure to quickly come to a place where we say, please forgive me, be willing to ask for, or ask for forgiveness, and be, and be quick to also give forgiveness. Because the longer that you wait, the greater the gap is between the time the sin happens and the forgiveness happens. And it just keeps on getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and our hearts grow callous. And it doesn't bother us anymore. And we see two people getting further and further and further apart. So it's important when there is conflict, that when there is a time when, 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 uh, when, when there, there is hurt that is involved, that we come together and we resolve our conflict before it bubbles up, it stores up inside of us, and all of a sudden, kaboom, atomic bomb all over the place. And we've got a huge mess to, to clean up. And it's something that we teach our kids too. We, we purposely have them come together and say, you know, they forgive each other. You wronged her. Ask her to forgive you. And you can say, I forgive you. And they hug and they make up and everything's good. You know, we, we realize that they may not always be sincere, but we're teaching them a principle that it's important that when a sin does occur, when hurt does occur, that we don't let that gap between the hurt and the, and, the, and, the, and the restoration be distant. Because when it is, when it is distant, it just grows more and more and more, and our heart gets call- more callous and more callous and more callous. But imagine how incredibly different our relationships would be if we owned our own sin, confessed them, and prayed together. Imagine that. Peacemakers apologize when they're wrong. But how do we do that? We don't make excuses. And we admit specific actions. All right? We don't make excuses. And we admit specific actions. Number three, we're going to close with this. We need to forgive and let go. And I want to be sensitive here because I know that there's people here that have had some, had some extremely hurtful things that, that have happened to you in the past. And, and, uh, and, and I know there's a lot of pain that people have experienced. Some things that, that happen that one another, each of us can't identify necessarily with what others people have gone through. Because there's some baggage that we've carried all our life. There's some people who in our life that hurt us tremendously. Someone who trusted us, violated us, or somebody who we, we thought was going to protect us, didn't protect us. And you might be thinking, well, you've got your little preacher life with preacher problems and you don't get it. But you know what? I do know what hurt is may not be able to totally identify with some of the hurt and the pain that some people are going through because I haven't walked in your shoes. For some, it might be a spouse betrayed you. Others, it might be that somebody committed adultery on you in your marriage and there was, there was unfaithfulness that happened there. Somebody's supposed to protect you, but somebody's abused you and you, they figure, you think to yourself, well, how could I ever forgive that kind of hurt? How could I ever 
How could I ever? That was so hurtful. It was so uncalled for. What I'm telling you, I'm not telling you that it's easy to forgive. What I'm telling you is that it's doable and that you can forgive. It's not always an easy thing to forgive, but forgiveness doesn't require feelings in order for that to happen. You don't have to feel like to forgiving somebody. You don't have to feel like you want to forgive somebody. You don't have to have all these good feelings towards somebody. You could still be hurt. You could still be experiencing the pain. You could be in the midst of the hurt. But forgiveness is a choice. We do not live our life by feelings. We do not live our life by emotions. That is a part of us. They're very real. And there's there's a part of that that's perfectly fine and good. But to make our choices and our decisions upon our feelings, the the Bible says, says, says don't follow your heart. It's deceitful. Because when we live our life on how we feel, we make the wrong choices. So when people, for, when, when we're in the hurt, we can make a decision. God, I need your help. I'm choosing right now to forgive this person. Man, what they did to me was, was totally wrong. But Lord, right now, and I believe there are some people here today in your relationship, in your marriage, in your home. You've got to make the choice to walk in forgiveness. You just got to make that choice. Lord, I'm, I'm going to make that choice and I'm going to let, I'm going to let my choice My feelings will follow my decision. My feelings will follow my decision. I'll make a decision. And I'm going to trust you to bring healing and restoration. Colossians 3.13 says this, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. You and I, before we knew Christ, we deeply offended God. We deeply offended God. In fact, we offended him so much that our our sentence was eternity in hell. Eternal separation from him. Because the choice that we made to separate ourselves from him because of our sin but he forgave us. He gave us everlasting life. We we think about the prodigal son and the the, the young man who who left his home and, and, and left all the inheritance and all the good stuff in his father's house. He ran away. He disrespected his dad. He spent all the money and he 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 was he and he, he was in the lowest point of his life. And he thought to himself, if I could only go back to my father's house and just be a servant there. I don't think he wants me. I hurt him too bad. I don't even know if he'll forgive me. But if I can just go there, if I can just be a servant in his house. Little did the young man know that his dad had been looking for him. He looked down the driveway, he looked down the street and looked for his young man, I believe. It just in my, my mind, he, he would just he would just he was looking down the road every day, looking for the young man to see if he's coming home. Day after day after day looking for his son. Meanwhile, the son didn't think that his father would accept him. Meanwhile, the, 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 the son was, was deep in sin, deep in, deep in offending, just, 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 just bring dirt to his father's name. And one day he saw the boy. And the father opened up his arms and he ran and he embraced. He embraced his son. Let's forgive just like God has forgiven us. There may be somebody who's hurt you. It's not going to be easy. And the healing process is not going to be something that necessarily happens overnight. But choose, choose to forgive, choose to love, choose to walk in forgiveness. Let's pray. Let's sing that song.
I believe that there are people here today. You're here right now, and you're, you're hearing this message, and, you're, and I believe that you're needing some healing in your life. Your, your heart is broken. Your heart is hurting. There's been disrespect. There's been, there's been hurt that's happened. Today, in your, even in your family, you feel like there, there needs to be restoration. There needs to be peace. And the cry of your heart is, Lord, heal us. Heal my marriage. Heal my relationship with my children. Heal that relationship with that uncle. Heal that relationship with, with my father, with my mom. Some of you. Father, and you think to yourself, Father, what they did to me was beyond what I could be capable of forgiving. But I'm going to make a choice today. But I'm going to make a choice. I'm going to trust you to help me in this. And that might be where you start today. Lord, help me to forgive. Today, maybe you're, you're, you're crying out to God. Maybe right now God is speaking to your heart and there's somebody in your family, somebody in your life that you need to walk in forgiveness. You need to resolve some issues. Maybe today you need to become a peacemaker and maybe talk through some issues in your life, in your marriage, in your, in your relationship with your children. And you need God's help. And you will recognize right now, God, I need your help. Help me to be a peacemaker. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. We're going to pray. Yes, 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 yes. Father, you saw the hands that were raised. And today, Lord, in Jesus' name, you know our hearts. You know what's going on in our families, Lord. Help us to take personal responsibility. Help us, Lord, to be the peacemakers. Help us, Lord, not to, not to avoid conflict, but, Father, to, to resolve the issues, to talk through them, to be able to, be able to come to a point where there is restoration. Father, bring healing into families. Bring healing into our own lives. Because, Lord, we want to have homes of shalom, of healing, of wholeness, of prosperity, of tranquility. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Would you just stand with us today? And let's sing this song. And some of you today, man, there might be some healing that needs to happen. I just want you to, to cry out to God in this song. And let's take this time to worship him and just get into his presence. Let God do a work in our spirit inside of our heart today. And let's worship him as we prepare to dismiss. Let's worship him today. Pour out your heart to him today. Yes, Lord, we worship you. We worship you, Lord. Yes. Restored relationships is not impossible. Forgiveness, it's not impossible. Healing in your family, it's not impossible. Healthy, thriving marriage, it's not impossible. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, we worship you.
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that it speaks to our hearts. It speaks into our lives. Father, today, as we, as we take your word to heart, and that we are doers of your word, and we're not just hearers of your word, but we put our faith in action by, by acting upon your word. I believe, Lord, that today will be a day of new beginnings for some families, be a, a day of new beginnings for some relationships as we, as we, we make a decision, as we make a choice to be peacemakers rather than peacekeepers, Lord. That we're willing with your help, with the, with the help of the, the Prince of Peace, be able to resolve the issues, and to work things out. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.